verbal or adverbial uses of infinitive construct. In the last module, we looked at how we can use the infinitive construct as a noun in a sentence. In this module, we'll look at how we can use the infinitive construct as a verb or an adverb. An adverb simply being a word that modifies or describes a verb. Now, this verbal adverbial use is actually the most frequent, more frequent than the nominal use. Um, and I find it actually fairly straightforward to translate. So if you just follow what I'm, uh, how I'm suggesting you translate these things, I, th I think it'll be fairly straightforward for you. The verbal adverbial use of the infinitive construct almost always has either b, l, or k in front of it. So we will look at b and k first, and then we'll look at l. So two parts to this module. B and K, when you find an infinite construct with either B or with K, you simply translate the B or the K with when or as, or perhaps while, some sort of temporal marker. When, it means when, you just think about that way. In this context here, B or K on infinite constructs, it means when or as, or perhaps while, something to do with time. If you just remember that, uh, and, and start off your sentence that way, while something, blah, 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 then uh, you'll be well on the way to translating these correctly. So let's look at some examples. Here we have b folk d, folk d of, or a, uh, Ah, this is the short A, ah, right? Bifokti et ami. So, if we just follow our translation suggestions here, when, and then this is our subject, because we have an object, when I visit, Pakad is to visit, when I visit my people. Okay, so all of this here, we apply all the things we already learned in the last couple modules. Here we, have a, here we have a pronominal suffix, acting as a verb, here we have the object of the, of the infinite construct, and b just simply translated as a temporal, when or perhaps as. I mean, it'll be your context that'll tell you whether it's when, as, or while, but something to do with time. When I visit my people. Okay, another example. Ke shom acha et hakol. So again, we have a kamatatuf, kishom acha et hakol. When you, subject, hear what? The sound. When you hear the sound. So if you just translate it that way, then you're fine. Um, or perhaps as you hear the sound, or while you hear the sound. Again, the difference between those will be will come from context. You can't tell just by looking at this by itself. Okay, let's look at another one here. Beyom acholcha mimenu. And I forgot an oo here, or it somehow dropped off. Let's try and get it in here. There we go. Okay. Beyom acholcha Mimenu. So here we have the kamatatuf that's moved over one. Remember, I said that uh, that that can happen in the in the second person masculine forms, singular or plural. We have a, a, a inversion here of the of the shava and the kamatatuf. And we also notice that because this is a first guttural, we have a a compound shava because gutturals, of course, can't take the simple vocal shava. So this example here, this comes from Seo, page 259, and is taken from Genesis 2, 17. When, we'll just ignore Yom for a second, when you eat from it. Now, Mimenu, if you go back to chapter 21, we talked about Min with the pronominal suffix, and uh, we noted that the 3MS and the 1CP forms are the same, from it or from you or uh, from it or from him is the same as from us. Now here in context it's clear that this is 
this is uh, the tree that we're talking about, the tree in the garden. So this is from it. Anyway. Beyom acholcha memenu. You could say, in the day you eat from it. That would be more literal. But you could also say when. It still has to do with time. Yom here is adding the sense of, it's telling you a little more precisely uh, when. So right away. Okay. Now time is actually not part of the... Oh, one other thing I wanted to say. If you compare this with the previous one. Here we had the preposition attached directly to the infinitive construct. And here we had it separated. So we had yom in between. So just recognize that uh, sometimes there will be a little bit of distance. But generally, it's attached directly to the infinitive construct. Okay. What I was starting to say is that time is not expressed by the infinitive construct itself. Time meaning past, present, or future. So you have to get that from the context. Now often, it will be indicated by these here. Vaihi, Vaihi and Vihaya. Vihaya. Now we've seen these before. We saw these in chapter 18. These are very common. And they're commonly used also with infinitive constructs, as they are with other verbs. What they do is they set off your entire sentence in either the past or the future. And what it is, is this is the verb to be, haya, as a preterite with the vav conversive. We've lost our, our dagesh there because it's a coal mine letter, but whatever. We still recognize it as a preterite because we have our patach there. Preterite plus vav conversive, or vav consecutive. And this here is preterite, sorry, is, is perfect plus vav consecutive. This means, literally, this could be translated, and it happened, and this could be translated and it will happen, but it's best not to actually translate them. Just use them to mark mentally in your mind, okay, we're in the, over here, we're in the past, therefore translate our verb in the past, and vice versa, we're in the future, translate the verb in the future. So let's look at some examples of these together with our infinitive constructs, together with but or, but or could. This example is from Seo, page 259, and it's taken from Genesis 35, 22. Vaihi bish hon Yisrael ba'aretz hahi. Now let me say a word on this here. Hahi, this looks rather strange, and it is really, it is kind of strange. What it is, is um, in the Pentateuch, the independent personal pronoun he, which means she, he means she in Hebrew. Um, he is almost always spelt this way, and it's pronounced he, and it means she or or the feminine form of the of the uh, independent personal pronoun. It, it seems to be a combination of he and who. See, who is who is like this? So it's got the u in there and E is like this, and this seems to be a combination, but what it's what it's referring to is this, he, and it's a peculiarity of the Pentateuch, so be that as it may, and here of course we have the definite article. So, we know we are marked here in the past. This is our infinitive construct. Uh, shahan here means to dwell, and we have a but um, a here, marking this temporally. So, when Israel dwelled in that land. This is a demonstrative use of the independent personal pronoun. So, when when Israel dwelt in that land, we, uh, we know to translate it that way as opposed to when Israel will dwell in the land, and the time is given by this, not by this. Okay, So, this sets it off in the past. Or perhaps, again, context will tell us, this could be while. In fact, I think in this particular context, while would be a better translation. While Israel was dwelling in the land, something happened. Or dwelling in that land. So as, while, or when is something you'll have to get from context. 
Let's take a look at another example of Vaihi. And this is... Oh, where did I get this from? I guess I just found this myself. I'm not sure. Or else it comes from uh, Ross. Vaihi kivo Avram Mitzrayma. Now, Mitzrayim is Egypt. This A here, an unaccented A, is the uh, directive hey. Remember that from chapter 17? It means direction towards. If you have an unaccented ha, you see the accent is over here. So, this is towards Egypt. So, the way we would translate this, this sets it off in the past. Bo is to come or enter. And again, we have key here. So, just translate it when, at least for now. When, as, or something like that. Um, when Abraham was entering Egypt or as Abraham was entering Egypt something like that but we know it's in the past because of Vaihi that sets it off in the past it's not the infinite construct that, that indicates past that's all I'm trying to say here let's take a look at an example of the future Vahaya so this is our future marker and this is Exodus 33.22 Vahaya ba'avor kivodi or kivodi. Kavad here is glory, to be heavy. In this case, it's a noun, glory. My glory, and this sets it off in the future. And avar is to pass by. So when my glory passes by, and this is from Exodus 33:22, when God is speaking to Moses. He says, when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand, etc. So, this is in the future. God was talking about something that was about to happen. It was in the future. And the future tense is marked by this. The infinite construct by itself doesn't do that. Okay, so that is how you deal with b and k on the infinite construct. You translate it something temporally. Uh, k, or a um, when, as, or while. And the time will be marked by something else, often by vaihi or vihaya. Let's now look at le. So le, if we have an infinite construct, we often have le in front of it. Now, with b and k, we usually have a pronominal suffix that indicates the subject. When so-and-so was doing whatever or as so-and-so is doing whatever. With le, it's frequent that you don't have one because the meaning is different. Uh, maybe always, I don't know, but certainly frequently you don't. So what happens here? We get a little bit of a morphological change, but again, nothing, nothing we can't explain. If we have picode, this is our infinite construct, right? Our basic infinite construct morphology. We have the cheval, and we have the holum. Now, if we put um, le on here, what do we have to change? Can you see what we have to change? Well, we have two shavas, right? Two vocal shavas, or two shavas at the beginning of a word means you have to apply the rule of shava, which means, or which says, that you leave the, f leave the second one alone, and the first one becomes a hiddick. So, I'll just erase it. Look at this. Lift code. Instead of lift the code, we get lift code. No big deal. Now, with b and k, that tends not to happen because if you have, I'll write it down here, if you have a prominal suffix on the end, you get that comma tatuf here, right? So we don't have the two shava problem. So that's all that's going on. Not a big deal. Now, this use uh, of the infinitive construct with l is fairly close to our English use of the infinitive, meaning to, or that we that we say with to, to something, to run, to jump, whatever. But hidden in to is a number of of meanings. So, uh, and actually, look, le means more than more than just the English use of of the infinitive uh, with to. It uh, but it, but it includes what we do in English. So we have three uses. We have purpose, 
and we have something called apexegesis, which is explaining the verb, and we have something called the object complement of the verb. Now these are kind of complex words if you haven't come across the, uh, these terms before, but I'll show you some examples and uh, tell you how to translate them and tell you what each one is answering, what sort of question. So our first one is purpose. Generally you'll translate this as to, and it is answering the question why. So, for instance, we have halachu lishmoa. Halach is to go, to walk or to go, and this is our perfect form. Remember, this is the one, the one with, or one of the forms in the perfect with the vocal ending. So we get pretonic reduction and this little method. And anyway, we can go back and review the perfect paradigm if you don't remember that. So halachu, they went, Shema is to hear. They went to hear. Or to really emphasize the purpose meaning here, they went for the purpose of hearing. Okay? Why'd they go? They went to hear. We're answering the question why. Why did they go? They went to hear. So the infinite construct is answering why, and we translate with to. This is how the English infinitive is often used. So let's look at another example. Vilishmol Bayom Uvalila. Now this comes from Genesis one verse eighteen. And the verse before this talks about how God made the lights, the sun and the moon, and he put them in the heavens, and it says he put them in the heavens Vilishmol Bayom Uvalila. Mashal is to rule, to rule the day and the night. So again, it, it is translated with the word to, to rule, and it answers the question why. Why did God put the, the sun and the moon in uh, into the heavens? Well, to rule. This was the purpose, to rule the, the day and the night, to govern it. So those are two examples of le being used for purpose. Our second example is this fancy word called apexegesis, which simply means explaining the verb, exegeting the verb, I suppose. Um, and uh, we would generally translate with by, and it is answering the question how. It's telling manner, how, how this thing is going to happen. So let's look at an example. This is a SEO example from 258. And uh, it's found in 1 Samuel 14:33. Okay, Ha'am Hotiim. Notice we have a quiescent olive here. Ha'am Hotiim Ladonai Leechol Al Hadam. Okay, let's start over here, I guess. The people, Ha'am. Hotiim, this is to sin, and this is a participle, so let's translate as a continuing action. The people, let's put it in the past, were sinning, ladonai, le, and this has nothing to do with the infinitive construct, but le after a verb can often mean against. Um, so, after certain types of words, words that, or certain types of verbs that you would do something against someone. So, the people were sinning against the Lord. And then we have this here. We have le'echol. Let's look at the morphology first. If you remember, we had the basic form of the verb is this. Right? We put le on there. And it'll the shava on the le will become a hiddik because of the rule of shava, I said. Now, in this case, we have a guttural here. And the guttural happens to be Aleph, not one of the other gutturals. And so this, the guttural, let's take that off for a second. The guttural cannot have a vocal shava, right? So it's going to go to a compound shava. And the Aleph here is causing it to go to the Chataf Segol. And then what's happening here? Well, obviously it must be harmonizing, right? So this is going to F. But all that doesn't need to throw you. Uh, this explains it, but you don't need all that to read this. You'd probably recognize it as an infinite construct anyway. So let's go back to where we were. The people were sinning against the Lord, le'echol, something to do with 
eating and there's actually an implied word in here meat al hadam meat with blood with blood in it okay so that's how they were saying they're, they were sinning against the Lord because they were eating this meat that had blood in it so what is the function of this infinite construct with le the people were sinning against the Lord by that's how they were doing it by eating blood eating meat implied with blood in it with blood so this apexegetical use is where the infinite construct explains how the sinning, how the verb is happening. It's really adverbial, okay? It's describing something about manner, the manner in which the verb is is taking place or how. Okay, that's the second use. And I have another example, and this is a special example, because it's very common, and it's almost a technical example. You need to know this. Um, and it's the special word lay more. In fact, uh, it may even be in the vocabulary of Ross. It's so important. Or it's so common, you really just need to know it. This is worth memorizing. Le mor. I think Ross does have it in his vocabulary as a separate entity. Le mor. It comes from amar, meaning to say or to speak. And it's the infinitive construct. Uh, you can see it's quiescent here. Aleph is quiescent, and so this has lengthened to compensate. So it's a bit uh, odd morphologically as well. But let's read our sentence here. This comes from Joshua 3, verse 6. Vayomer Yehoshua el ha kohanim lemor. And you'll get sentences like this all over the Bible especially in narrative sections. Joshua said to the priests, saying... Now, in English, this is, this is redundant. You don't need to say, Joshua said to the priests, saying. But what this is doing is this is indicating what the content is of his speech. So it's like quotation marks. It's indicating what he's going to say, the content. And you'll frequently have this after words of speech, like he said, or he commanded. Joshua commanded the people, saying, um, and then this will be your quotation mark, and you run along and finish it here. So you don't need, don't need to translate this in English. It can also follow words of thinking, like, uh, or thinking or praying. Joshua prayed, and then they'll have lay more somewhere, and that'll give the content of his prayer, or Joshua thought, or whatever, something like that. So that this is an apexegetical use because it's explaining how, it's explaining the manner. Um, but uh, it's also just sort of a unique thing that you need to know because it's so common. The last use of le with the infinitive construct is what we call the object complement of the verb. And generally we translate this with to, just like we do the, uh, the first form. What did I call that? Purpose. Okay, but it's answering what as opposed to uh, what was the first one again? Why? Okay, two can answer why in English, and what can answer why. So let's translate this one. This is our last example. We just have one example of object complement. Yacholnu lishmor et, and I forgot a makif here. Et mitz otav so yachol is to be able and this is a perfect 1cs or 1cp new here means us right we so we were able lishmor to keep et mitz otav his commands Okay, this is plural. This yud here tells you it's plural. We were able to keep his commands. So the le here, plus the infinitive construct, is the complement of the verb. This verb needs something else. Able. Uh, we were able to what? We were able... If you just stop like that, you don't have the uh, rest of the verb. You really need another piece to this verb. And so that's why they call it a complement to the verb. We were able to to keep his commands. 
Now there are other verbs like this. This is really a function of the verb. Uh, verbs to be able, uh, perhaps to fear, to know, they will sometimes have an object complement. Now if you just translate this, you can translate this to, or you can translate the other one purpose, uh, back here, purpose, the translation is not really that difficult. It's sometimes you want to sit down and think, okay, what really is the infinite construct doing here? Is it purpose? Is it an object complement? Whatever. That's more an exercise of syntax, looking at the syntax um, and thinking closely about what's going on. But translating is really not too difficult. It usually just flows fairly easily. Okay. Now, by way of summary, this is really not too difficult. What we have basically is that the infinite construct can have can take b or k, and when it does, translate it as when, or as, or perhaps while, something temporal. The time, of course, is not set by the infinite construct itself, but something in the context, often vaihi or vihaya. And uh, then if you have l, then we have three options here. We have purpose. And purpose will translate as to, and we're answering the question why. And apexegesis, I want to write this whole thing out. Apexegesis. Generally, you translate that with by. Maybe I'll bracket this here. So that's answering how. And then lastly, we have this object complement. Object complement, and we also translate with to, just like we did with purpose. And if you're not thinking carefully about it, you may uh, not realize you're dealing with an object complement, but whatever. It answers the question, what? Able to what? To do what? So if you just learn these three here, these three Inseparable, inseparable prepositions with with the infinite construct. Translate these two as when, and then l has three uses, three main uses. Then you'll have down the adverbial and verbial uses of the infinitive construct.